And the intro is broken for some reason, but we're... <laughs> anyway, so we don't have our intro music. Uh, whatevs. We um, broke the intro music. <laughs> Way to go, Pyro. Um, Should have worked. Fix, fix it in post. <laughs> the outro hey. works. No, no, the show's not over yet. All right, show's over. Everybody go home. <laughs> All right, um, uh, Pyro, have you jumped on Facebook yet? I have not. All right, should I do that? I'll do it. Okay, you do that, since we need to deal with our contest thing, too. Indeed. Dis disappointingly few people on that. Oh, well. That is okay. Let's see. So, um, welcome to Nerd Talk, if you happen to be around for that. <laughs> uh, this evening, uh, I'm going to go through... The Star Wars The Old Republic Collector's Edition box, since I happened to get one last night. And, it's a big uh, box. Along with the guide. So, it's a rather big, impressive, heavy box. Hey, I said I was going to get to unbox it. Fine. Anyway. So, uh, this evening we're going to be doing that. Uh, Pyro is going to be reviewing... Uh, the new Sherlock Holmes movie, did, does it have a subtitle? A Game, game of, Shadows. of Shadows, which despite having game in the name is not actually a game. It's very deceptive. Are there shadows? Um, probably. Never mind. It's a Guy Ritchie movie. It's going to be not full really of shadows. Very important. There may or may not be some shadows involved. There are no shadow monsters. There's not like teleporting between shadows or... Shadows so what, don't have real implications. What, what you're saying around. is here, we're not watching Alone in the Dark with Robert Downey Jr. Correct. Darn, because that would actually be a kind of cool movie. Alrighty then. Alright, continuing. Um, do we want to do the giveaway right away, or should we wait on that? We should wait until we have some people in chat for that. I suppose. Chat folks, where you at? We need chatters. I uh, have been unable to type a message because I've been super distracted repairing the ten other ways that the show was not prepared for. <laughs> so much broke thanks to uh, the Old Republic. But we do have Mr. Cantaloupe in chat, which is always good to see. Hello, Cantaloupe. Delicious melon. Listen to all of Nerd Talk typing at once. <laughs> so much <laughs> type. type, type. Alright, I'm actually going to yield my posting on social network duties and instead talk about Sherlock Holmes. Alright, works for me. Okay, well, it has Robert Downey Jr. in it and he does take his shirt off. Not for very <laughs> long, and he is wearing drag when he does it, but he is shirtless. Jula <laughs> never gets shirtless, but Stephen Fry does, which is kind of weird. And maybe not as titillating as when Robert Downey Jr. does. No, that's right. We have <laughs> Stephen, Stephen Fry. Fry taking it off. As a matter of fact, Stephen Fry is completely buck naked in this movie. And they spend about <laughs> five to ten minutes doing the end of um, Austin Powers, where, where he's walking around naked and there's just conveniently placed foreground objects censoring his junk. Because we really haven't gotten enough of that lately. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's it. I'm sold. I'm, I'm watching this now. <laughs> Stephen Fry Naked sold you on a movie. <laughs> Come on! That's hilarious! It's a pretty good movie. Do I have to pull up an image of what Stephen Fry actually looks <laughs> like for this? Is that Robert Downey, Robert Downey Jr. is shirtless. Well, Dave, should... that's, that's how we got you to go see Fright Night, just promising shirtless David Tennant. Robert it's Downey true. Jr. is shirtless. But he's also and dressed as a woman at one point. Yeah. He has he has eyes and lips and cheeks and all of the makeup on, in very exotic colors. And he's wearing a bonnet, no shirt, but a bonnet. In the bonnet. All right then. Well then. All right. Well, I. So, can we get an overall plot synopsis of? Game of Shadows. 
The basic gist of the movie is that Professor Moriarty, the well-known rival from the novels and all of Sherlock Holmes fan fiction, of which there is a ton. Yeah, is, who, was, who was hinted at in the last film, uh -huh. but never shown. Um, Moriarty is doing the military-industrial complex thing that is a super standard villain plot wherein you buy up the means of arms production and medicine and then you incite a war so that you become super rich. And Sherlock Holmes, who is a crazy detective, is trying to stop him. Alright then. So, this is continuing from the Sherlock Holmes that came out, what, two years ago now? Yes. Which in was which also have, a very good movie. Yeah. In which we have... Robert Downey Jr. playing a very addled, I'd say, Sherlock Holmes. He's he's very true to what the character is rather than what he became in pop culture. It's it's yeah. it's very very close to his uh, his performance of Tony Stark. Yeah, he is basically a crazy man, and there is actually a lot of ways in which these movies adhere to the original fiction. They don't quite mention cocaine specifically, but they get pretty much all of the other small details right. There's references to the novels coming out your ears when you're watching this movie. The... One of the things that Sherlock Holmes does that's kind of a subtle reference to the books is that he tends to interrupt people they're with what they're thinking when they haven't been talking for a while. So the movie will be portraying somebody's inner monologue, and then and then Sherlock Holmes will just respond to it out loud. And they'll be like, what the heck? How did you know what I was thinking? And he's allegedly just that smart. And along those lines, there is a one of the coolest features of the 2009 Sherlock Holmes movie was that there was a boxing match wherein it was done in slow-mo, and Robert Downey Jr. dictated all of the actions and the reasons for taking those actions in the boxing match. So he would predict his opponent's moves and counter them, and he would describe it so that you could, you could know exactly what was going on. And they do that two or three times in A Game of Shadows, including once where he's doing it in a fight against Professor Moriarty, who is doing the same thing against him. And they're actually just having dueling inner monologues, thinking against each other, without even talking out loud, but talking to each other. And it works out for some pretty cool fight scenes, because of a necessity, you have a great sense of geography when you know exactly what the moves are and why they're being made. It's like just boxing All chess. the narration. All the narration. Um... The first I know you were particularly fond of that in the last movie. It, it yeah, was, those, those just were the one best fight scene in the last movie that was really compelling and well done. I thought. Anyway, you were saying. Um, the first scene where they do that in a game of shadows is kind of super dumb. Like instead of describing, well, he's going to punch high into the left, so I'm going to fall down and then try and trip him. He. The inner monologue is basically him explaining a recipe for making an omelet, and then, like, the punches he's throwing have something vaguely to do with how you would make an omelet. Like, he flips the guy, and then he's like, flip the omelet. I'm like, okay, well this is not quite as interesting as actually explaining the mechanics of the fight, but then, later, later on, there's two more fights like that where they're more serious about it. There is a Darth? new protagonist in this movie called, who is a gypsy, played by Numi Rapace. And she's just some random gypsy who is in France, and her brother got caught up in Moriarty's plot, and she's looking to find him and rescue him. And then she winds up going on an adventure with Sherlock and Watson, and she's kind of fits in right away with not much explanation. She also is kind of talented at detective work and adventuring without... It just kind of happens. 
which is a little bit dumb, but overall, the movie is very good at the details and puts everything together in a sensible way. Um, lots of one-liners, lots of things that are almost like in old Arnold Schwarzenegger movies, where he would throw the bad guy in front of a train, and then later he'd walk back to his fellow good guy, and the fellow good guy would be like, what happened to the bad guy? And Arnold Schwarzenegger would be like, he had to catch a train. There, there were, there were one-liners almost of that variety fairly often. Lots of spunt, lots of quick, short, clipped humor that I appreciate. Yeah, the, the art of the one-liner has kind of been lost on modern films. It doesn't show up as much as you'd expect. Yep. I would so, almost expect it to be beaten to death, but this is the only movie I've seen recently that even uses it. Uh, a lot of the focus of the last movie was on specifically the relationship between Sherlock and uh, and his assistant. Watson? Yeah. Is that kept throughout this movie? Because it seems like we... That is followed through extensively. Yeah, um, it seems like we kind of met a of The movie a lot consists part. of Watson's wedding and Sherlock ruining it. Well, of course. In extensive ways. Just completely destroying the wedding. So, yes. How, how do the action scenes hold up in this movie? Because that was like the one complaint I had about the previous movie. Some of the action scenes didn't seem necessary, I'd say is the word. There's one scene that goes on for a long time where they're running away from an arms factory and there's a bunch of um, shooters and artillery men shooting at them. It goes this on would for be five the, or ten minutes that's super extended. This would be the slow motion forest shots that were all over the previews, right? Yeah. And there's so much slow motion and fast motion in this movie. That one scene goes on for probably longer than necessary, but all of the other fighting is well placed in the plot. It makes a lot of sense and it doesn't waste your time. The geography is not necessarily very sensible when they're not narrating it. Like, it's just a blur of, oh look, there's a hand, there's a foot, there's a torso, there's a head. But they're exciting and short. The, the bad geography is very similar to what you'd expect from a Michael Bay Transformers movie. It's just there's, there's stuff just flying like all around. Half a second of a shot. Yes, lots of quick cuts. And that is one of the reasons I really appreciate the narration is that when you're explaining how the fight works, you can't get away with that. You have to make sense and be like, there's a guy over here and a guy over here, and one guy does this and the other guy responds this way. And so the narration fight scenes are very good. The random fight scenes are a bit muddled, but they're short and fun. So I would say the fighting is better than the previous movie. Well, that's good. How is the overall climax scene? Because that, that was another one of the problems I had with the previous movie. And we had such a great lead-up. We had such a cool villain. And then, oh yeah, he got dropped off a bridge. The end. Well, the ending is pretty awesome. And I'm actually going to refrain from spoilers for once. Yeah, because it did just come out. Also, I would it like is, to see it. It is a powerful ending. And it is... I, I, I want to ask, does it set up for another sequel? I cannot say. Okay. Alright then. So it's not going to be like the new Batman movie, which has already set up that there will not be a sequel. Okay, the last scene of the movie actually consists of the nameplate, The End, question mark. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, I suppose that, that that's sufficient. I, I think I can see where this is going already. Okay. Maybe. I, I definitely can't say too much. Okay, so we'll definitely not spoil Wolf, this. Wolfen seems to think that there that there's going to be a third and fourth. All right, then. Greenlit and ready to go. It's really weird to see movie franchises get in the fours these days. Well, I mean, 
I, I think we can blame, like... That used to be a really, really rare thing. I, I think we can blame, like, movies like, um, well, Harry Potter and... Yeah, that they've realized that these franchises can just keep going. Because well, like, back in the day... The idea of having, like, that overarching, like, storyline between, like, that many movies... Yeah, but back in the 80s and the 90s, I, I say back in the day, and I realize that that's not everyone's day. Most people remember the 2000s fondly. Um, in the 80s and 90s, the only movies that got past, like, the four level of sequels were, like, the B-list horror movies. Because you'd have, like, Friday the 13th, Part 10! Um, but yeah, I agree with Wolf in here in chat. Guy Ritchie really has nothing else to do. <laughs> Guy Ritchie is just like, Robert Downey Jr., you're my friend. Can you come make movies with me again after the Avengers makes you turbo rich and you don't have to do anything anymore? Sure. I guess. <laughs> yep. Since you put it that way. All yeah, right, it, so anything else that we need to say about uh, Sherlock Holmes' Game of Shadows? Totally worth seeing? Uh, definitely worth seeing. Um, it's a bit chunky yet two hours and eight minutes. Probably it could have been a little more tightly edited, but the, I had a lot of fun seeing it. Jude Law never takes his shirt off, which is disappointing. That's all that I got. That is a bit disappointing. Did any of the female characters take their shirts off? Mm, no, no, I don't think so. It is a man candy movie for you, Pix. I, I guess you earned this one. Kratz. I don't know if it counts as, like, man candy when... Robert Downey Jr. He's tarted up like a whore! <laughs> in only one scene. Is yeah, he shirtless in any other... Yeah, that's he's shirtless. Exactly. Oh, I see. He, he's not given any other man candy context. Actually, the boxing scene that I'm so fond of in the 2009 version is one where he was very shirtless. And, you know, muscly and oily. You know... I'm kind of agreeing with Wolfen on one thing in chat here. I really want to see Tintin, and it is really hard right now to pick which movie I want to see, because, like, I want to see the new Mission Impossible because of Simon Pegg. I want to see Sherlock Holmes because I was really happy with the first one. And I really want to see Tintin because it's a different perspective in an animated film not based on something that's of U.S. origin. I kind of want to see that. And You could just well, go to all of these movies. Just, like, make a day of that, movie that's after expensive. movie. <laughs> let me, let me read off a few names associated with Tintin. First of all, there's Hergé, who started the franchise. But then yeah. this iteration of it is Steven Spielberg, Peter Jackson, and Steven Moffat. So yeah. that is that is E.T., Lord of the Rings, and the new Doctor Who. Th those are some big names. And supposedly it's really good. It, it's not an animated film designed for kids. It's a movie that happens to be an animated film, as I understand it. Mm. There's constant drinking. There's gunfights. Uh, chases that nearly result in the main character's death. Characters' deaths. This is, this is a pretty hardcore film. All right, then. It, it, it does not play down for its audience. Well, we've only got half of the show left, so I guess I'd better get around to this thing. Yeah, there, yeah, this is a huge box, and like any, if you're listening to the segment, you might want to just go to the video feed after the show, like totally tune in. But I guarantee you, you will be able to see the things that we're actually showing off while we unbox this, because there's not much more we can say about the Old Republic since we pretty much gave it a, a thumbs up approval from the betas that we've been participating in. Although, Although we I have played like. 40 additional hours of it since then, including so, one session of, like, 12 unbroken hours. Well, I guess the question... I think it's closer to 10. The question comes up, closer then, to is, 10. is there any major difference in between your experience in the beta and your experience now? They've tweaked nope. some things, exactly but still the same. got some bugs. Yeah, it, it's pretty much the same thing. I mean, it it's a solid MMORPG. Um, I saw it online focused the best. If this you was, like Bioware games... You'll love this. Th this well, was a comment if you I like uh, MMOs. You'll like this. I, I want to stress again that it's not. It's not really Mass Effect, which is what it was marketed as for years, among its extended development process. It is. It is World of Warcraft with dialogue trees. 
Well, I'm liking this a lot better than World of Warcraft, and it adds a whole lot. The the companions add a whole lot of mechanics that I've actually taken up crafting since the testing thing, which I didn't do before, mm -hmm. and that is so much better than any other MMO has pulled it off. Yeah. One of the comments that I read on Kotaku this morning where they were discussing it was that uh, this is the first MMO RPG with the RPG capitalized, where it, it's actually an RPG versus an yeah. MMO RPG with the MMO capitalized. Yeah, I, I, I feel like in this in this instance I'm actually playing as a character, whereas in games like WoW and Rift and such these are just, like, avatars for myself. Yeah, well, th these are just the tools that your abilities come from. Mm -hmm. The only thing that this affects is what buttons I'm seeing on screen for me to do my attacks. Yeah. Versus, yeah, playing the Old Republic, I felt like I was my Sith. I was totally playing that character. I didn't know. I was always... thinking about, you know, into going through the conversation trees, thinking about, well, what would this character want to do? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think that's the strong part of this game. So, okay, you've got this, like, big impressive Uber Collector's Edition box in front of you. I guess we should uh, open it and start taking a look at the stuff. All right. Well, I've also got the Explorer's Guide, which will help. Um, so that's basically their uh, strategy guide that came out with kind the Kind of. Um, it's got maps. Was that included in the set? No. Uh, this was, like, an extra 20 bucks. Okay. So this is our book that will probably be outdated in a couple months when the right. game is tweaked. A strategy guide for an MMO is always a fool's errand because it changes very frequently. Oh, well, it's, it's I actually it, it goes over the classes, it goes Warcraft over some, strategy guide. It gives it from gives 1. you some, it, it gives you some tips on how to play like different classes, what the different classes do, what each what the two different specializations for each class are good for. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some basic class introductions. Uh, we flip through here. It gives you maps of the available planets, uh, areas where enemies are, points of interest. So you can um, find all the nice little extra stuff that's been hidden in the environments. Yeah. Because there is and a the, lot. The datacrons, which are like things that give you like a permanent boost to stats when you find them, you can only find them once. Oh, and, cool. Um, you interact with them, they give you, like, say one of them gives you a permanent plus two to your aim ability or something like that. And they're usually made to be really difficult to find or require solving a puzzle or something like that. And so this will show you where all those are. There's usually about three on each planet. Nice. How many planets are currently in the game right now? If just, I just look back to the index <laughs> here. Uh, Alderaan, Belmora, Belsavis, Corellia, Coruscant, Stroman, Cass, Hoth, Hada, Ilum, Corban, uh, Narshada, Ord Mantel, Quesh, Taris, Tatooine, Tython, Voss, that's... Well, 17. Yeah. How is Some it of those are, like, faction-specific, obviously. You're not going to be a Jedi going to Korriban, but... How on earth is it that, like... Actually, you could be a Jedi going to Korriban because they... They did take part of it. There's a peace treaty. Um, how is it that, like, the Star Wars universe always paints Tatooine as this, like, out in the middle of nowhere, complete boo why would you go here, planet, and yet it ends up in every game or movie. Because it's a running joke now. <laughs> no one goes to Tatooine. We're going to Tatooine. We're gonna make you go to Tatooine so that you appreciate when we send you somewhere else, is what it turns out to be. Well, one of the interesting things about Tatooine from a lore perspective is basically that the galactic governments just don't bother to go that far away from the core worlds to impose law on it. So that's where all of the smugglers and crime lords live. Because it's just a long trip from the core worlds. Um, there is something else in this uh, guidebook here that I find interesting. I'm a little bit disappointed there's no crafting guide, obviously, but uh, there's concept art in here, which is really freaking gorgeous. Yeah, Bioware is known for their artists doing an amazing job with every okay, so bit of concept art. There's a whole bunch of concept art here. Cool. Sit in action, great like great wide shot landscapes and So yeah, that that alone is mm -hmm. pretty neat and there's several pages of that. i definitely say, I, I love all of the planet art that they've done. Oh, cool. Races that aren't quite in the game yet. 
Or at least not playable classes. Not playable characters, but she's actually a character on a particular planet that you run into. That really is the one bit of criticism I have for the older public. I would have loved to see more player races in the game. Even then, the races do very nearly nothing. They have no stat effects, and they yeah. get one special move, which is just an animation. Mm-hmm. It has no consequences other than you do a brief animation. Yeah, which, which I think could have been done better. And sometimes there's, you know, dialogue based on that. Yeah, when your character is pulling the race card. Basically. How or dare I ran, you say or I ran into, as a Twilight like, female, I ran into somebody who was like, oh, I do find your people so charming. And it's like, perv. Yeah, I had someone accuse me of obviously being a bad warrior for having cybernetics. It's like, well, someone must have owned you. It's like, screw you, I was in a shuttle crash when I was ten. Anyway, hello, Tall. Welcome to chat. More um, chatters. I guess we should get this thing unboxed. Yeah, right? So, really right big start, box. This is a nice box. Like, this is nicely decorated. We have really cool art. A of, bounty hunter. Of the various scenes. Republic trooper. Uh, named uh, characters. Some descendant of Basil Shans. And then we and have our Darth Malgus, yep. leader of the Imperial faction. So, basically. Really nice big box. I'll, uh, I'll let you handle this since it's yours. Oh, shoot. Um, I forgot. There's a little authenticator that comes with this thing. A little keychain thing. Yeah, so right off the bat you've got an authenticator to keep your account safe. Something WoW really should have done. Statue of Darth Malgus is in here. I haven't opened this and this has got a whole bunch of styrofoam and stuff in it so this will be a big mess if we want to actually open it. It looks like Vader without his helmet. Just saying. That's the character though. Yeah, like, I, I get that Sith Lords don't exactly this all have the most... It's a pretty sizable statue. I was expecting something smaller. Sith Lords don't need the most unique design, but, geez, you could put a Vader head on that toy and it would be Vader. All right, then. All right. Uh, the soundtrack. Sweet. Not on a Blu-ray. I don't know. Thanks, Idos. You know, you could just buy a Blu-ray player, Sen, or a drive. They're, like, fairly cheap now. I find it really insulting to have to buy a Blu-ray drive to listen to the soundtrack that came with a game. I keep, like, peeling off bits of the... And, and, like, it, it was horrible because you'd put in the extras disc and click soundtrack, and it would be like, put this in your Blu-ray player. I, I'm using a Blu-ray player. What do you think my PlayStation 3 is? Um, also comes with a map of the known galaxy. In case you get lost. Oh, it makes for a neat little poster. It's a neat little poster, but it's totally impractical. Like, it's cool for your role-playing fantasy to be able to go, Oh, I'm in this part of the galaxy now. Sweet! But, like, in game sense, it doesn't tell me who I have to go to and what I click on to get those planets. Oh, but this is for that. This, yeah. is being, this yeah. isn't supposed to be an in-game benefit. There are, there are those, too. We'll get to those in a minute. Uh, this is the tin. Spiffy tin collector's case. The imperial symbol on one end, public symbol on the other. right This it's your activation key. Three discs. <laughs> wow. It's a big game. Not that I need that because I've already got the client. Yeah. So it'll have your registration code, instructions. Dare ask what that is. Uh, some coupon for $30 off of a statue with a bounty hunter, I think. Oh, cool. Pixie protecting her codes. I haven't used that code yet. Instructions for installing it, yeah. And once again, a game that doesn't come with a manual. Because manuals aren't cool. I don't know why they didn't just put the soundtrack in here. That's an excellent... Because they needed to give you something extra for it. In fact, I'm going to do that right now. Right. So, did this ever fully close? It did when I got it. I mean, it was in a fully closed position when I received it. It would be pretty amusing if you went It'd to the store and you're like, I want my hundred dollar box of same like and it's just like loosely packed in and oh, just wedged it's, open. It's just, he can't get the, thing, the top to sit right. I actually haven't even taken the shrink wrap off the disc yet. The journal is actually in the back of the box. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'm going to take that off. 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 Y
Compiled by Jedi Grandmaster Satella Sean. None of that means anything to me. There we go. Box really? Closed. The name Sean doesn't mean anything to you? Ah, uh, yeah, that's right, Bastila. Apparently Revan didn't have a last name, or Bastila really didn't care for him all that much. Or maybe that's just not a tradition there? I don't know. I didn't think they were supposed to have kids to begin with, so, oops. Okay, so, this is written out basically like a diary. Oh, and we have full like color art box. inside. Yeah, there's bits of art there. On the history of the Jedi Order. Okay, okay that, act actually, that actually is really a nice bonus. That, that's pretty cool. This is, you know, some of it looks to be, like, handwritten that's supposed to be, like, in the character. Mm -hmm. And some of it's oh. just information. This appears to be actually explaining the plot of the previous Old Republic games. So hey, maybe they'll fill in that plot hole at the end of KOTOR 2. And then the world promptly ended. Return to the Sith Empire. The art in here, as always, is fabulous. Mm -hmm. Oh, look, a smuggler. That's the smuggler. Yeah. Oh, hey, there's a paper there's in here. There's a thing in here. This is where they tell you this book will self-destruct. Shield generator defense plan. Yeah. This was tucked into a certain pa page on uh, space combat. You know, many boffins died to bring you these. I think that's what this is, actually. And so, yeah, this is really interesting. I have no idea what this means, but I have a feeling it's, like, something for... There's actually other papers stuffed into strategic uh, hmm. pages here. I, I get the feeling that's part of a, a game flashpoint that you will be using later. There's a couple more papers here. You now have a copy of the... Wow. The Jedi Temple's floor plan. I find it funny that you got a document actually signed by Darths. The Treaty of Coruscant? You have you have a copy of the Treaty of Coruscant, just in case you need proof that that treaty occurred. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, this book is awesome. Yeah, it seems like you're kind of like making fun of it here. But... I'm making fun of the Star Wars universe in general, but I think this is an awesome like collector's edition tie-in. Yeah, I think that was the last of it. But, yeah. Because clearly the Treaty of Coruscant is a binding contract, or this game wouldn't exist. Oh, well, no, there are actually certain plot points where they're like, well, you know, this is technically against the rules because, you know, the treaty here, they can't find out there's Republic involvement or whatever in certain battles. I'm, I'm just... I, I constantly go back to World of Warcraft and the... Wait a minute, these two factions are at peace? What? Yeah, as long as it's our adventurers that are killing each other, it's totally fine. Yeah, wait, Doug Malgus probably needs to go in there first. Yep. So yeah, as far as uh, as far I as collectors' no editions how to go, this, out. this was pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. And I'm really happy with this. Yeah, this seems like a much better deal than that you got than uh, when I picked up the Marvel vs. Capcom this was collector's kind of edition. ridiculously expensive, but... But when you're getting a bound But they're not making cover... any more of these. So whatever ones got sold, that is it. And yep. so I imagine some unopened ones of these are going to go for, like, buku bucks on eBay. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right. So, yeah, that's the Old Republic. Um, is the Nerd Talk Guild set up yet, or is that still coming? Uh, no, I haven't bothered with it yet. <laughs> Were you saying something, Pyro? When it does exist, it will exist when on the Ebon Hand. When it does exist, it will exist on Sith the Ebon Hand. hand. Sith Eben alignment. Ebon Hawk. Ebon Hawk, yes. Ebon Hawk. Not on yes. the Shadow Hand, which Not on the was Shadow Hand, which was... Wow server I played. That. Wow server I played. Right <laughs> I thought we played on the Shadow Council. 
Okay, it's there's two okay, it's, servers on there's WoW that two I had characters, servers on, on, WoW that I had characters the, on, and their names Shadow were the Council and the Shattered, Shadow hand, Council and the which Shattered were hand, to each other. which were very and similar so to each other. Mixed up. And so I even get those oh, mixed up. Basically, I can't keep any. Oh, servers basically, on I any can't MMO keep MMO any servers on any MMO. Just the put Shatter. them all in a pot and stir it. Just together. put them all in a pot We're and stir it together. We're on the Shattered hand server. That's right. We kind of fail at opening things. Yeah, I just wanted to open these pickles. I just wanted to open these pickles, but then I was like. No, my hand uh, exploded. So yes, yeah, so if you'd like to join us for fighting with red lightsabers, we're on the Ebon Hawk server, which KOTOR fans should have no problem remembering. Just be aware, this is an RP server, so please, name your characters accordingly. I'm looking at you, Dark Darth Sith. <laughs> yes. And Joel yes. the Black Man. And Joel the Black Man. <laughs> no names like that. No names like that. Take it seriously or go to a PvP server. Uh, you, you have yet to buy this game. Yeah, because I'm avoiding the, uh, the server rush, as it were. And I haven't had a queue since it, since the game officially launched. Yeah, See, I, I, I opened I, it up. Yeah, just I, I opened it up before the show, just about an hour before the show, and there was a ten-minute queue on our server, which is one, that, server, was which is one that was available and one that before has a fairly launch, high population. and one that has a fairly high they, population. The Hawk server in the KOTOR MMO. Yep. So, I mean, there, there, and several other um, servers just opened up last night, and so they're all very light population. Yep. So hopefully that'll balance out in the coming weeks. Mm -hmm. Yep. So well, I, I feel like the that, staggered, uh, the staggered launch thing was really a big success. Yeah, I, I think it's a positive thing that hey, the people who really wanted this game, who are really excited, we're gonna let them in early to reward them for their enthusiasm and for pre-ordering this when they did. Mm -hmm. that That's a great idea. That's a company showing support to their fans. It also lets them rev up the servers, make sure everything's working. I don't think we've seen any, like, catastrophic crashes of any servers since launch, which is always good for an MMO. Because the classic thing is, yeah, the servers barely run, the lag's so bad you can't do anything, and most of the time you're just sitting around in a queue waiting to get back in after you got kicked. Mm-hmm. That doesn't seem. Here. Yeah, no, this is the smoothest MMO launch I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. So, serious uh, props to Bioware for getting that off the ground. Indeed. All right. So while they've been playing their uber spiffy new MMO, I've been continuing League of Legends. Yes, and the new champion that you've been playing. Yep. Uh, so last week's new champion release was Ari, the Nine Tail Fox. A Which, of course, I immediately purchased. As did I. As did a lot of people. Ari is actually one of the most played champions in the game right now. But the question uh, needs to be answered. Is she good? Does she deserve this title? Pyro, has it for have you had the chance to see an Ari in-game yet? I have not played with her ever. I have not played with okay. her ever. So, what we essentially have here is a highly mobile, spell-casting, assassin-type character. Which is normally an odd combo, because you think Assassin in League of Legends has to be a melee character, has to have a stealth ability to get up behind the enemy, and has to do something to hold the enemy in place while they kill them. Ari has only one of those things. Ari is designed to be a ranged casting character who, when the time is right, can leap upon the enemy and destroy them in very short order. Uh, her passive which is uh, called Soul Eater, gains a charge every time one of her spells hits an enemy. Uh, each spell can gain up to three charges. When she reaches her ninth charge, her next spell will receive 35% life steal. Ari can literally replenish half of her health with a single well-placed spell. Which is great for sustain, which usually you'd think these kind of characters don't have. If they take damage, the only way they're going to get health back is over a long period of time, or by going back to the base. Ari can make herself extremely aggressive, and on that ninth spell, regenerate a good portion of her health, provided you're, you're very good at placing your skill shots. Uh, Ari as a character is a little more difficult than some of the other casters in the game, because of the fact that she has not one, but two skill shots built into her character, and they are both critical to how she plays. Her Q, or basic ability, is uh, her Orb of Deception, 
This is a ball that Ari carries with her at all times. She shoots the ball out to very good range. Uh, for a caster, this has excellent range. And then pulls the ball back to her. And it will follow her if she moves. So you can use this to actually line up shots after you've uh, fired off the shot. We'll get into that a bit more when we get it's into her. It's a lot her. like Silver's Boomerang. Yeah, when we get into her ultimate, we'll, we'll talk about that a little more. Uh, the shot does a good degree of damage on the way out, and on the way back, the same amount of damage is done as true damage, so completely ignoring any kind of armor or resist that enemy champions might have. This is huge. If you can place the shot properly to where the enemy is standing at the absolute maximum range of the shot, it will do full damage for both. So you will just see the enemy's health explode if they're standing at the maximum distance of the shot, because they get hit by both the coming and going of the hit. There, there's no lag distance between the two, so you'll never have... Well, the enemy was standing at the absolute extreme of the shot, so he only got hit by the damage of it coming back. The game is very good about allowing both sets of damage to occur. This is a very... It's a very painful spell to be hit by. And it's got such extreme range that you can harass most enemy casters right out of a lane by, with a few well-placed versions of this. Um, I was playing against a Rise a couple days ago that just could not get range on me since he had to come in closer for his moves than I had to for Orb. Uh, I played against a Vigar who just could not get anything to work on me because any time I saw him running in to do his uh, shield stun, I would just throw the orb once and back away. And by the time the orb hit its maximum distance, he was struck by both uh, both forms of it. Um, Ari just can dominate a middle lane using only this ability. And as long as you're not spamming it, you shouldn't run out of mana because the cooldown is uh, moderate enough that if you pause for maybe three or four seconds between each orb strike, she should have regenerated enough mana back to sustain that for a while. It's a pretty powerful loop. Her next ability, her W, is called Foxfire. Ari creates three spinning orbs around her that, upon an enemy coming close enough to her, will f automatically fire away from her and strike the enemy. When you use the ability, you have about 10 seconds before the orbs disappear, which is a great amount of time to get an enemy champion in range, or just to hold it as kind of a threat to keep your enemy at bay. Now, I, I've seen melee champions watch me put up Foxfire, and then back away, because they realize they're going to get hit really hard if they come too close to me. Uh, the spell does less damage with multiple hits to the same champion, which is unfortunate, but kind of a balancing issue that had to happen. So, for instance, if one champion runs in too close and procs all three of them, the first orb will do maximum damage, which is a decent amount, and then the other two orbs will do half damage. Uh, this is also great because it can target minions if you need to just clear out a wave. And, uh, again, we'll come to the true purpose of this when we get to her ultimate ability, which is to just do as much damage to a single target as possible while dancing around them, essentially. Um, Ari's next ability is her best offensive tool, and the reason why she's great paired with a partner. Uh, this would be her charm ability. Uh, her second skill shot, actually. So Ari projects a heart-shaped pr uh, projectile. She blows a kiss. Yeah. It fires out as a heart. It has great speed. And upon striking an enemy, it will do a moderate amount of damage Just to them. a champion? Or... No, it can hit anything. Okay. An, an enemy. You can also use this on the jungle mobs, and it will have the same effect. That enemy will take damage, and then be forced to harmlessly and slowly walk towards your character for between 1.25 and 2 seconds. This is better than a taunt. Not only does it have great range, which most taunts aren't known to have, the enemy also won't be attacking anything when they get hit by this, and they take damage from the projectile, which has a great range. Not quite as good as the orb, but still great range. If Ari hits an enemy champion with this early game, and has a partner, you can guarantee that target's going to die. This is also great if you're uh, solo laning and just want to trick your enemies into walking into your turret over and over again. Because while they walk forward, doing nothing, they will walk right into a turret range and then have to run out. 
pretty much if you catch someone on the edge of a turret, they'll get hit by three shots before Charm is up and before they've managed to run away to safety. That's enough to kill most champions early game. This is also great for team fights. If you target that one champion in the fight who's doing the most damage, you've effectively pulled them out of the fight, caused them to do no damage, and should be able to just blow them up before you are ready to either run away to safety or continue helping the team fight. Mm -hmm. Finally, we have Ari's ultimate, which is uh, called her Spirit Walk. Actually, I think it's called Spirit Fire. Ari dashes forward and then launches three projectiles out of herself, which uh, will target enemy champions over enemy minions. So not only is this a rush move that can be spammed up to three times in a row before going on cooldown, it also does an incredible amount of damage and sets Ari up for hitting with her other abilities very well. As I said, you've got a couple seconds between using it and it going on cooldown until you've used it three times. So the best way to do this is to use it to dash into a team fight. You'll hit three targets. Then you can fire off your other abilities. So this is actually a great time to use Foxfire because once you've rushed in, that's now six projectiles that have possibly struck a single target. Uh, her ultimate also doesn't have any kind of scaling ability on the number of hits. Meaning that you can run in, pelt the three different targets. Uh, her sprint will never all target one target. It'll always try to split up. If you have less than three, you'll only ever fire off against one. And the, the thing that makes Ari great for this is... You can rush in, use all four of your abilities, and it's pretty much guaranteed to kill one champion, if not more, because of the spread of the damage. Making Ari an incredible team fight uh, character if she can stay alive, which she should be able to, given her ultimate. So, no, D Dylan, this sounds a little OP. So, this sounds a little OP. Is, the do you thing think that, that she is, that is strong? Do you think to the that she's strong relative to the other champions and or I think cruising for an the other casters? Yes, she's definitely the top pile of the caster as I see it. Um, I, I really like the Zareth character, but he doesn't have enough uh, burst damage to be able to really kill a target. Um, he can fire a spell or two, which really hurts, and his ultimate could potentially kill someone. But uh, in a team fight, he's only got so much he can contribute. Ari will be hitting, or can hit, three more than three champions with three of her abilities. The only one that's required to be a single target is her charm. But all of her other powers can hit multiple champions. That makes her incredible for what she is. And I don't think she's going to take a nerf because each of her abilities already has some kind of limit on it. Her ultimate can only ever hit a single target once. The only exception to that is you can use it three different times, each time costing mana. Her Foxfire has already been checked for how much damage it can do. I mean, that, that was the terrible thing about Graves when he came out. His uh, Buckshot ability had no check whatsoever. If you hit someone with all three projectiles, they take triple damage. That made him crazy. Ari's already only doing half damage with each of the fox fires. Uh huh. So no, I, I don't think this character is going to uh -huh. take any kind of nerf at all. I, I think she's just very solid, and if you're a player who's really good with skill shots and likes uh, AP champions, she's right up your alley. She is a great character for this. The trick is that you do have to be pretty goodish. The trick is shots. that you do have to be yeah, pretty if, goodish if skill you're shots. If the two otherwise... primary skill shots, she's a much weaker character. Her two auto-targeting abilities are not strong enough to pull her as a champion. Mm -hmm. You need to be hitting with Orb of Deception, and if you can, hit both on the way there and on the way back. Uh, I was mentioning another use you could do with the Orb with retargeting. If you fire off the Orb and while it's on its way out, use her ultimate to move in a direction to have the orb swing into an enemy champion, it will. It will retarget as you move. So you could potentially get an insane distance out of the orb just by moving with your ultimate, 
while the orb is out. You could potentially hit entire lanes worth of enemies by just dashing away from your orb as quickly as possible. Mm-hmm. Cool. So yeah, I, I really cool. like Ari. I think she is a great champion that has been added to the game. Uh, we've also had a an unofficial teaser of the next champion that's going to be coming out. He's in the game's files. You can find him there. He hasn't been announced, though. So this would be Victor the Machine Herald. The first character in the game who actually comes with an item. He has an item that can be modified or upgraded throughout the course of the game, just on him at the start. And does he still start with the same amount of money? And does he still start uh, with the same amount of money? So we haven't seen any announcements or any data for him, though, uh, regarding that. So that we haven't been able to check. We have seen what his moves do and what his passive is. Uh, His passive is the ability to choose his passive. So by upgrading this item that he starts the game with, it locks in a different passive for your character, which changes how Victor plays. He should be a really unique champion when he comes out. So do those passives get progressively better? Do those passives get like progressively better? Because it seems like if you were spending around, money on upgrades and you were just changing around, it, it's that'd only be a bit the lackluster. ones that you can upgrade. Okay. You, you upgrade the item by deciding okay. what form you want it to take. So you can either take the destruction form and make him an AP champion. You can take the gravity form and make him a utility champion. Or you can take the I think it's called. Uh, it's like the machine form and make him into a defensive champion. Cool. Yeah, it, it's a neat idea and cool. I really want to see where they're going with it. They haven't announced anything for Victor yet, but his files are in the game, all of his sound effects are in, his abilities are already in the game. So it, it would be really hard to believe that this could, champion could be cancelled at this point. Mm-hmm. Now, we only had three people enter for our uh, trying giveaway. I don't know if we want to hold off on that for a bit. Nope. Nope. You giving it away? Nope. Yep. I've double-checked. All three of them are eligible. They've all liked our Facebook page, which you should do, too, at facebook.com slash nerd talk. We like likes. We like you. Kyra, are you going to do the honors? The winner is dun 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 dun. The winner Walker is Thompson. dun 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 dun. Or, dun. As it is Walker Thompson on Facebook, or Tom as it is strictly written on Facebook, with the P after Tom the S. Spun. With right. the P That's after Walker the Tom S. Oh, congratulations! Way to go, dude! You have won yourself a copy of Trying. All right then. And then. So we will send you the code. For and then that coming up. Thanks for participating, everybody. So yeah. One more bit of business before we go this evening. Yep. I don't know if you've seen the new trailer for The Dark Knight Rises. I've not. So the internet is all abuzz about it because Bane is in it. I, I sat and watched this trailer, and my first response to it was, What did Bane say? Like, uh, I'm sorry, but Tom Hardy is really hard uh, to understand wearing that mask. Also, I have no freaking idea what the plot is for this game or for this movie. <laughs> you see. Like, we've, we've got... I, I can figure out that Bane is some kind of terrorist. But what his motives are for attacking Gotham, like, is completely unclear. Besides to irk Batman. Which, admitted, that was the Joker's thing. I am... Completely confident I am in Christopher Nolan. Completely I'm, confident I in Christopher Nolan. Have, I'm... Very few I doubts that the plot will turn out incoherent. Very few doubts that the plot will turn out incoherent because so well Christopher so Nolan has times in a row. done so well so many times in a and, row. Yeah, I actually I, had no problem understanding Batman. And I actually had no um, problem understanding Knight, Batman which in which everybody complained um, about the Batman the Dark Knight, voice in the Dark which Knight. Which everybody yes, complained about the Batman voice I, in the I, Dark Knight. And yes, it was weird. But I, I was so able do you to think understand Christopher what Nolan was, was kind of griefing the audience with, "All right, you couldn't understand Batman? Here, try this guy." Maybe. It is possible. Maybe. We'll make sure you it don't know possible. anything that comes out of his mouth. And if, even the trailer is not necessarily and the final if, cut of the movie. Even the trailer is not yeah, necessarily voice, the final cut of the movie. There's time to do voice replacement up, until, voice, voice replacement up until the very, very end. I'm wondering end. what Especially with a mask. thinking by trolling a football game by having the entire field sink 
Not like fall away to kill anyone, but like just oops, pulled the field out from under you on that one. Yuck. I can't get <laughs> yuck, the yuck, yuck. to look. Bane <laughs> trolls a yuck, football game. That is all that 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 was. He dropped the field out from a bunch of football players. They probably survived. He he's just trolling. He he's just trolling. We shall see. Yeah, like, we I, shall see. Christopher Nolan has proven himself There's... as a great director. Yes. Trailers are never big enough to expound. Trailers on are never big enough to motivations. expound on complicated I mean, it's just character a motivations. I don't know. You could figure I mean, out it's the Joker's just a motivations trailer. pretty well from the Dark Knight trailer. That <laughs> oh wow, he's scary. This is going to be bad. Pretty much by way of simply already knowing. The Pretty Joker much by way of simply already knowing the Joker is a character areas. who's been long established in multiple. But I mean, medias. we're establishing Bane here as some kind of terrorist. Try watching this. Yeah, Pixie just got through the part of the boy singing the national anthem. Also, Alfred being sad because he let all this happen. Well, because he was enabling him. Yeah, basically. The entire time he's like, yeah, be Batman. Be awesome. And we apparently are going with the plot that Harvey Dent died at the end of The Dark Knight. If massive falls and everything will kill you. It is true. But yeah, Bane it is true. looks kind of ridiculous overall, and Catwoman feels like just a useless addition. But as, as is common from Christopher Nolan trailers... You have no idea what the heck is going on in this movie. Like, Bane is leading some kind of armed terrorist group that made up of prisoners and mercenaries against Gotham. I think this is the kind of thing we call it the army see- for. I've been seeing a lot of uh, jokes like, about Selena here, Kyle being the 99%. Here's Bane trolling a football game. Like, they didn't fall to their deaths, that's just a hole. I'm I'm not understanding what's going on here. I'm sure it will be awesome. I'm sure it will be a spectacle to watch, and it will be cool. We also now have flying cars in The Dark Knight. That's a thing now. And Bane driving a jumper tank. At, At least we're being promised that this is the last one. That... No holds bar. Yes, Batman can die now. In fact, it's going to be kind of shocking if he doesn't. So yeah, that that's kind of the big buzz on the internet right now, and I guess we'll see when it comes I, I, out. I do see a lot of jokes about how Selena Kyle is the 99% and how this is supposed to be some sort of reference to the Occupy movement. What, stealing from Bruce Wayne? Yep. Oh, because she's got specific lines about you people live so well and leave so little for the rest of us, and da-da-da. Relevant! Alright, so be sure to check this out if you haven't seen it yet. But for tonight, this has been Nerd Talk. I'm Pixie. I'm Sen. And I'm Pyrosin. If you'd like to contact us on Facebook, you can always find us at facebook.com slash nerdtalk. Uh, let's see. We've also got a Twitter where you can follow me. Uh, I'm Nerd Talk Pixie on there. If you want to see something added to the show or have something you'd like us to talk about, be sure to leave us a message. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Uh, you can email us at hosts at nerdtalkshow.com, or you could uh, drop by our forums at nerdtalkshow.com slash forums. Or so you could this... post on our Facebook page or leave a comment on or the YouTube video. Or you could video. post on our Facebook page or leave That's a comment too. on the YouTube video. So for this fine December 20th, 2011, we wish you have happy holidays and, you know, get, get stuff. cool stuff. We know we will. <laughs> All right. Have a good night, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>
I'm yep. sure I'm glad you got to review something, Pyro, because otherwise we'd have been kind of screwed. <laughs> I actually um, could have. Actually, next week we do have a review. What's what? that? Next week we have a review. Of? Super Dungeon Explorer. Oh, right, because it'll be Christmas and you'll get to use that. Yup. Alright, well, I need an hour to upload the video to Winnesquip. And Sen and I are going to get food. Okay. Thanks, Dylan. Bye. 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 Bye.